there we go. Okay, we're in our third week of reading Parable of the Sower, and um, my name is Sass. I'm with Resources for Organizing and Social Change, um, and I'm going to give a little recap of where we're at for this week or what we've done up to this week, and then we'll start our story. And I will be doing a screen share for that to help people process so that they can read along with it if that's helpful. Um, so the story starts in November 2024. Our protagonist, uh, Lauren, we learn has something called hyper empathy, hyper empathy where she um, feels what happens to other people, whether it be pain or pleasure, um, to the extent that that if somebody gets like severely injured, she can bleed from that. Um, and she is living in a hellscape that is full of sexual assault and violence. Um, and the class divide is very stark. She lives in a walled in community. Um, and the climate crisis has come to a pitch where sunny days are basically unbearable. And last week, um, we started off in November of 2024, where um, they just had uh, an election and their new president, um, whose name is Christopher Donner, um, is trying to entice employers to hire homeless folks by promising to do away with what he calls over restrictive, um, overly restrictive laws around minimum wage and environmental and worker protections. Um, we also learn that Lauren begins mentoring a three-year-old named Amy, who she finds mildly annoying, um, but in need. And so she, she decides to mentor this child. And through the actions of this child, we learn that the fire department is something that you have to pay for the service. Um, she ended up causing a huge fire and they did not call the fire department because they couldn't afford it. Um, we also learn, oh, before I go, any further. I'm sorry, I should have started this with a content warning. There is a lot of violence and graphic description of sexual assault and whatnot. So if that is something that is not okay for you, this probably isn't a thing you want to continue to listen to. Um, moving on, we learned that Amy uh, was conceived through incest, which seems to be normalized. Um, Clearly, Lauren doesn't think it's okay, but she also talks about it pretty matter-of-factly, so you get the sense that, like, this is something that maybe isn't um, totally out of the norm. Um, we also meet Mrs. Sims next of kin, and Mrs. Sims, for those who don't remember, was an elderly neighbor who um, died by suicide after losing the majority of her family in an arson fire. Um, and the next of kin who are there um, are acting very suspicious of the family and the people who are surrounding that house because there are a lot of items missing and they don't appear to believe um, the, the story that, that people had broken into Mrs. Sim's house and stolen things. Um, and um, then we find that she is being taken out for target practice with a group with her father. Um, and in that we learn that um, she is black. Some of the folks that she is with are white, um, but that the norm is segregation, though the neighborhood that she is in is so small that it, out of sheer like necessity, um, in numbers, they don't practice segregation. Um, therefore, when they leave their walled community, they kind of get a lot of funky stares and whatnot. Um, and we learn earlier in the story that she has a huge crush on somebody named Curtis Talcott, who by this time has become her boyfriend. Um, we don't fully know what kind of person Curtis is yet, but we do learn that the society is incredibly toxic with patriarchy, um, so much so that like women are just sort of treated like conquest, um, particularly by like middle class and, and rich folks who have um, basically a lot of concubines. And, and if they get if they get women pregnant um, and won't protect them, like the wives might throw them out and leave them to starve. Um, we end up experiencing some of her hyper empathy as she's out for that target practice. Um, she she um, 
uh, and we also learn that her father illegally owns some um, some machine guns um, that he's not supposed to have. And despite being a pastor, he's like a staunch advocate for people learning how to use weaponry um, for their own protection. Um, and where we leave off is in, uh, it's either March or May of 2025, where we learn that the little girl that she was mentoring, Amy, has died through in um, what they're assuming was somebody accidentally shooting her through the gates. Um, they think it was accidental because you can't see through them and there's just like constant gunfire right outside the walls. Um, and specifically where we're leaving off is um, Lauren is in conversation with her friend Joanne where they're considering whether or not um, the people who have died are those who are who are better off. And so, that is where we are. I'm going to screen share now and then pull up the story and we will get into it. There we go. So let me move this a little bit. It's not in the way. Okay. What are you talking about? Amy was the first of us to be killed like that. She won't be the last. Joanne sighed, and there was a little shudder in the sigh. So you think so too? I do, but I didn't know that you thought about it at all. Rape, robbery, and now murder? Of course I think about it. Everyone thinks about it. Everyone worries. I wish that we could get out of here. Where would you go? That's it, isn't it? There's nowhere to go. There might be. Not if you don't have any money. Not if all you know how to do is take care of babies and cook. I shook my head. You know much more than that. Maybe, but none of it matters. I won't be able to afford college. I won't be able to get a job or move out of my parents' house because no job I could get would support me. And there are no safe places to move. Hell, my parents are still living with their parents. I know, I said. And as bad as that is, there's more. Who needs more? That's enough. She began to eat the bean salad. It looked good, but I thought I might be about to ruin it for her. There's cholera spreading in southern Mississippi and Louisiana, I said. I heard about it on the radio yesterday. There are too many poor people, illiterate, jobless, homeless, without decent sanitation or clean water. They have plenty of water down there, but a lot of it is polluted. And you know that drug that makes people want to set fires? She nodded, chewing. It's spreading again. It was on the East Coast, and now it's in Chicago. The reports say that it makes watching a fire better than sex. I don't know whether the reporters are condemning it or advertising it. I drew a deep breath. Tornadoes are smashing the hell out of Alabama, Kentucky, Tennessee, and two or three other states. 300 people dead so far, and there's a blizzard freezing the, north, uh, the northern Midwest, killing even more people. In New York and New Jersey, a measles epidemic is killing people. Measles! I heard about the measles, Joanne said. Strange. Even if people can't afford immunizations, measles shouldn't kill. Those people are half dead already, I told her. They've come through the winter cold, hungry, already sick with other diseases. And no, of course they can't afford immunizations. We're lucky our parents found the money to pay for all of ours. If we have kids, I don't see how we'll be able to do even that for them. I know, I know. She sounded almost bored. Things are bad. My mother is hoping this new guy, President Donner, will start to get us back to normal. Normal, I muttered. I wonder what that is. Do you agree with your mother? No, Donner hasn't got a chance. I think he'd fix things if he could, but Harry says his ideas are scary. Harry says he'll set the country back a hundred years. My father says something like that. I'm surprised that Harry agrees. He would. 
His own father thinks Donner is God. Harry wouldn't agree with him on anything. I laughed, distracted, thinking about Harry's battles with his father. Neighborhood fireworks, plenty of flash, but no real fire. Why do you want to talk about this stuff, Joanne asked, bringing me back to the real fire? We can't do anything about it. We have to. Have to what? We're 15. What can we do? We can get ready. That's what we've got to do now. Get ready for what's going to happen. Get ready to survive it. Get ready to make a life afterward. Get focused on arranging to survive so that we can do more than just get battled around by crazy people, desperate people, thugs and leaders who don't know what they're doing. She just stared at me. I don't know what you're talking about. I was rolling too fast, maybe. I'm talking about this place, Joe, this cul-de-sac with a wall around it. I'm talking about the day a big gang of those hungry, desperate, crazy people outside decide to come in. I'm talking about what we've got to do before that happens so that we can survive and rebuild, or at least survive and escape to be something other than beggars. Someone's going to just smash in our wall and come in? More likely blast it down or blast the gate open. It's going to happen someday. You know that as well as I do. Oh, no, I don't, she protested. She sat up straight, almost stiff, her lunch forgotten for the moment. I bit into a piece of acorn bread that was full of dried fruit and nuts. It's a favorite of mine, but I managed to chew and swallow without tasting it. Joe, we're in for trouble. You've already admitted that. Sure, she said. More shootings, more break-ins. That's what I meant. And that's what will happen for a while. I wish I could guess how long. We'll be hit and hit and hit. Then the big hit will come. And if we're not ready for it, we'll be like Jericho. She held herself rigid, rejecting. You don't know that. You can't read the future. No one can. You can, I said, if you want to. It's scary, but once you get past the fear, it's easy. In LA, some walled communities bigger and stronger than this one just aren't there anymore. Nothing left but ruins, rats, and squatters. What happened to them can happen to us. We'll die in here unless we get busy now and work out ways to survive. If you think that, why don't you tell your parents? Warn them and see what they say. I intend to as soon as I think of a way to do it that will reach them. Besides, I think they already know. I think my father does anyway. I think most of the adults know. They don't want to know, but they do. My mother could be right about Donner. He could do some good. No, no, Donner's just kind of, just a kind of human banister. A what? I mean, he's like like a symbol of the past for us to hold on to as we're pushed into the future. He's nothing, no substance. But having him there, the latest in two and a half century long line of American presidents make people feel that the country, the culture that they grew up with is still here, that we'll get through these bad times and back to normal. We could, she said. We might. I think someday we will. No, she didn't. She was too bright to take anything but the most superficial comfort from her denial. But even superficial comfort is better than none, I guess. I tried another tactic. Did you ever read about bubonic plain, uh, plague in medieval Europe, I asked? She nodded. She reads a lot the way I do, reads all kinds of things. A lot of the continent was depopulated, she said. Some survivors thought the world was coming to an end. Yes, but once they realized it wasn't, they also realized that there was a lot of vacant land avail available for the taking. And if they had a trade, they realized they could demand better pay for their work. A lot of things changed for the survivors. What's your point? The changes, I thought for a moment. They were slow changes compared to anything that might happen here, but it took a plague to make some of the people realize that things could change. So, things are changing now too. Our adults haven't been wiped out by a plague, so they're still anchored in the past, waiting for the good old days to come back. 
but things have changed a lot and they'll change more. Things are always changing. This is just one of the big jumps instead of the little step-by-step -step changes that are easier to take. People have changed the climate of the world, so they're waiting for the old days to come back. Your father says he doesn't believe people changed the climate in spite of what scientists say. He says only God could change the world in such an important way. Do you believe him? She opened her mouth, looked at me, and then closed it again. After a while, she said, I don't know. My father has his blind spots, I said. He's the best person I know, but even he has blind spots. It doesn't make any difference, she said. We can't make the climate change back no matter why it changed in the first place. You and I can't. The neighborhood can't. We can't do anything. I lost patience. Then let's kill ourselves now and be done with it. She frowned, her round, too serious face almost angry. She tore bits of peel from a small navel orange. What then, she demanded, what can we do? I put the last bite of my acorn bread down and went around to my night table. I took several books from the deep bottom drawer and showed them to her. This is what I've been doing, reading and studying these over the past few months. These books are all, are all old, like all the books in this house. I've also been using dad's computer when he lets me to get new stuff. Frowning, she looked over, she looked them over. Three books on survival in the wilderness, three on guns and shooting, two each on handling medical emergencies, California native and naturalized plants and their uses, and basic living, log cabin building, livestock raising, plant cultivation, soap making, that kind of thing. Joanne caught on at once. What are you doing, she asked, trying to learn to live off the land? I'm trying to learn whatever I can that might help me survive out there. I think we should all study books like these. I think we should bury money and other necessities in the ground where thieves won't find them. I think we should make emergency packs, grab and run packs, in case we have to get out of here in a hurry. Money, food, clothing, matches, a blanket. I think we should fix places outside where we can meet in case we get separated. Hell, I think a lot of things. And I know I know that no matter how many things I think of, they won't be enough. Every time I go outside, I try to imagine what it might be like to live out there without walls and I realize that I don't know anything. Then why I intend to survive, she just stared. I mean to learn everything I can while I can, I said. If I find myself outside, maybe what I've learned will help me live long enough to learn more. She gave me a nervous smile. You've been reading too many adventure stories, she said. I frowned. How could I reach her? This isn't a joke, Joe. What is it then? She ate the last section of her orange. What do you want me to say? I want you to be serious. I realize I don't know very much. None of us knows very much, but we can all learn more. Then we can teach one another. We can stop denying reality or hoping it'll go away by magic. That's not what I'm doing. I looked out for a moment at the rain, calming myself. Okay. Okay, what are you doing? She looked uncomfortable. I'm still not sure we can really do anything. Joe, tell me what I can do that won't get me in trouble or make everyone think I'm crazy. Just tell me something. At last, have you read all of your family's books? Some of them, not all. They aren't all worth reading. Books aren't gonna save us. Nothing's gonna save us. If we don't save ourselves though, we're dead. Now use your imagination. Is there anything on your family bookshelves that might help you if you are stuck outside? No. You answer too fast. Go home and look again. And like I said, use your imagination. 
any kind of survival information from encyclopedias, biographies, anything that helps you learn to live off the land and defend ourselves. Even some fiction might be useful. She gave me a sidelong glance. I'll bet, she said. Joe, if you never need this information, it won't do you any harm. You'll just know a little more than you did before. So what? By the way, do you take notes when you read? Guarded look. Sometimes. Read this. I handed her one of the plant books. This one was about California Indians, the plants they used, and how they used them. An interesting, entertaining little book. She'd be surprised. There was nothing in it to scare her or threaten her or push her. I thought I had already done enough of that. Take notes, I told her. You'll remember better if you do. I still don't believe you, she said. Things don't have to be as bad as you say they are. I put the book into her hands. Hang on to your notes, I said. Pay special attention to the plants that grow between here and the coast and between here and Oregon along the coast. I've marked them. I said I don't believe you. I don't care. She looked down at the book, ran her hands over the black cloth and cardboard binding. So we learned to eat grass and live in the bushes, she muttered. We learned to survive, I said. It's a good book. Take care of it. You know how my father is about his books. Thursday, March 6th, 2025. The rain stopped. My windows are on the north side of the house, and I can see the clouds breaking up. They're being blown over the mountains toward the desert, surprising how fast they can move. The wind is strong and cold now. It might cost us a few trees. I wonder how many years it will be before we see rain again. Chapter six. Drowning people sometimes die fighting their rescuers. Earthseed, the books of the living. Saturday, March 8th, 2025. Joanne told. She told her mother, who told her father, who told my father, who had one of those serious talks with me. Damn her. Damn her. I saw her today at the service we had for Amy and yesterday at school. She didn't say a word. Uh, she didn't say a word about what she had done. It turns out she told her mother on Thursday. Maybe it was supposed to be a secret between them or something. But oh, Felita Garfield was so concerned for me, so worried. And she didn't like my scaring Joanne. Was Joanne scared? Not scared enough to use her brain, it seems. Joanne always seemed so sensible. Did she think getting me into trouble would make the danger go away? No, that's not it. This is just more denial, a dumb little game of, if we don't talk about bad things, maybe they won't happen. Idiot, I'll never be able to tell her anything important again. What if I'd been more open? What if I'd talked religion with her? I'd wanted to. How will I ever be able to talk to anyone about that? What I, did, uh, what I did say worked its way back to me tonight. Mr. Garfield talked to Dad after the funeral. It was like the whispering game that little kids play. The message went all the way from, we're in danger here and we're going to have to work hard to save ourselves, to Lauren is talking about running away because she's afraid that outsiders are going to riot and tear down the walls and kill us all. Well, I had said some of that, and Joanne had made it clear that she didn't agree with me, but I hadn't just let the bad predictions stand alone. We're gonna die, boo-hoo. What would be the point of that? Still, only the negative stuff came home to me. Lauren, what did you say to Joanne, my father demanded. He came to my room after dinner when he should have been doing his final work on tomorrow's sermon. He sat down on my one chair and stared at me in the way that meant, where is your mind, girl? What's the matter with you? That look plus Joanne's name told me what had happened, what this was about. 
my friend Joanne. Damn her. I sat on my bed and looked back at him. I told her we were in for some bad, dangerous times, I said. I warned her that we ought to learn what we could now so that we could survive. That was when he told me how upset Joanne's mother was, how upset Joanne was, and how they both thought I needed to talk to someone because I thought our world was coming to an end. Do you think our world is coming to an end? Dad asked with no warning at all. I almost started crying. I had all I could do to hold it back. What I thought was, no, I think your world is coming to an end and maybe you with it. That was terrible. I hadn't thought about it in such a personal way before. I turned and looked out a window until I felt calmer. When I faced him again, I said, yes, don't you? He frowned. I don't think he expected me to say that. You're 15, he said. You don't really understand what's going on here. The problems we have now have been building since long before you were born. I know. He was still frowning. I wondered what he wanted me to say. What were you doing then, he asked. Why did you say those things to Joanne? I decided to go on telling the truth for as long as I could. I hate to lie to him. What I said was true, I insisted. You don't have to say everything you think you know, he said. Haven't you figured that out yet? Joanne and I were friends, I said. I thought I could talk to her. He shook his head. These things frighten people. It's best not to talk about them. But dad, that's like, like ignoring a fire in the living room because we're all in the kitchen. And besides, house fires are too scary to talk about. Don't warn Joanne or any of your other friends, he said. Not now. I know you think you're right, but you're not doing anyone good. You're just panicking people. I managed to suppress a surge of anger by shifting the subject a little. Sometimes the way to move dad is to go at him from several directions. Did Mr. Garfield give you back your book, I asked. What book? I loaned Joanne a book about California plants and the way the Indians used them. It was one of your books. I'm sorry I loaned it to her. It's so neutral, I didn't think it could cause trouble, but I guess it has. He looked startled. Then he almost smiled. Yes, I will have to get that one back, all right. You wouldn't have the acorn bread you like so much without that one, not to mention a few other things that we take for granted. Acorn bread? He nodded. Most of the people in this country don't eat acorns, you know. They have no tradition of eating them. They don't know how to prepare them, and for some reason they find the idea of eating them disgusting. Some of our neighbors wanted to cut down all of our big live oak trees and plant something useful. You wouldn't believe the time I had changing their minds. What did people eat before? Bread made of wheat and other grains, corn, rye, oats, things like that. Too expensive. Didn't used to be. You get that book back from Joanne. He drew a deep breath. Now let's get off the side track and back onto the main track. What were you planning? Did you try to talk Joanne into running away? Then I sighed. Of course not. Her father says you did. He's wrong. This was about staying alive, learning to live outside so that we'd be able to if we ever have to. He watched me as though he could read the truth in my mind. When I was little, I used to think he could. All right, he said. You may have meant well, but no more scare talk. It wasn't scare talk. We do need to learn what we can while there's time. That's not up to you, Lauren. You don't make decisions for this community. Oh, hell. If I could just find a balance between holding back too much and pushing, poaching. Yes, sir. He leaned back and looked at me. Tell me exactly what you told Joanne, all of it. I told him. I was careful to keep my voice flat and passionless, but I didn't leave anything out. I wanted him to know, to understand what I believed, the non-religious part of it anyway. When I finished, I stopped and waited. 
He seemed to expect me to say more. He just sat there for a while and stared at me. I couldn't tell what he felt. Other people never could if he didn't want them to, but I've been able to most of the time. Now, I felt shut out, and there was nothing I could do about it. I waited. At last, he let his breath out as though he had been holding it. Don't talk about this anymore, he said in a voice that didn't invite argument. I looked back at him, not wanting to give a promise that would be a lie. Lauren. Dad. I want your promise that you won't talk about this anymore. What to say? I wouldn't promise. I couldn't. We could make earthquake packs, I suggested. Emergency kits that we can grab in case we have to get out of the house fast. If we call them earthquake packs, the idea might not bother people so much. People are used to worrying about earthquakes. All this came out in a rush. I want your promise, daughter. I slumped. Why? You know I'm right. Even Mrs. Garfield must know it, so why? I thought he would yell at me or punish me. His voice had, that, had had that warning edge to it that my brothers and I had come to call the rattle, as in a rattlesnake's warning sound. If you pushed him past the rattle, you were in for trouble. If he called you son or daughter, you were close to trouble. Why, I insisted. Because you don't have any idea what you're doing, he said. He frowned and rubbed his forehead. When he spoke again, the edge went out of his voice. It's better to teach people than to scare them, Lauren. If you scare them and nothing happens, they lose their fear and you lose some of your authority with them. It's harder to scare them a second time, harder to teach them, harder to win back their trust. Best to begin by teaching. His mouth crooked into a little smile. It's interesting that you chose to begin your efforts with the book you lent to Joanne. Did you ever think of teaching from that book? Teaching my kindergartners? Why not? Get them started on the right foot. You could even put together a class for older kids and adults. Something like Mr. Ibarra's wood carving class, Mrs. Bader's needlework classes, and young Robert Hissou's astronomy lectures. People are bored. They wouldn't mind another informal class now that they've lost the Yanni's television. If you can think of ways to entertain them and teach them at the same time, you'll get your information out. And all while making anyone look down, without making anyone look down. Look down? Into the abyss, daughter. But I wasn't in trouble anymore. Not at the moment. You've just noticed the abyss, he continued. The adults in this community have been balancing at the edge of it for more years than you've been alive. I got up, went over to him, and took his hand. It's getting worse, Dad. I know. Maybe it's time to look down. Time to look for some hand and footholds before we just get pushed in. That's why we have target practice every week and laser wire and emergency bell. Your idea for emergency packs is a good one. Some people already have them for earthquakes. Some will assemble them if I suggest it. And of course, some won't do anything at all. There are always people who won't do anything. Will you suggest it? Yes, at the next neighborhood association meeting. What else can we do? None of this is fast enough. It will have to be. He stood up, a tall, broad wall of a man. Why don't you ask around, see if anyone in the neighborhood knows anything about martial arts? You need more than a book or two to learn good, dependable, unarmed combat. I blinked. Okay. Check with old Mr. Hsu and Mr. and Mrs. Montoya. Mr. and Mrs.? I think so. Talk to them about classes, not about Armageddon. I looked up at him, and he looked more like a wall than ever, standing and waiting. And he had offered me a lot. All I would get, I suspected. I sighed. 
okay, Dad, I, I promise I'll try not to scare anyone else. I just hope things hold together for long enough for us to do it your way. And he echoed my sigh. At last, good. Now come out back with me. There are some important things buried in the yard in sealed containers. It's time for you to know where they are, just in case. Sunday, March 9th, 2025. Today, Dad preached from Genesis 6, Noah in the Ark. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts and of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me, and I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then, of course, later God says to Noah, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. <laughs> Clearly, I haven't read the Bible. Dad focused on the two-part nature of this situation. God decides to destroy everything except Noah, his family, and some animals. But if Noah is going to be saved, he has plenty of hard work to do. Joanne came to me after church and said she was sorry for all of the craziness. Okay, I said. Still friends, she asked, and I hedged. Not enemies, anyway. Get my father's book back to me. He wants it. My mother took it. I didn't know she'd get so upset. It isn't hers. Get it back to me. Or have your dad give it to mine. I don't care. But he wants his book. All right. I watched her leave the house. She looks so trustworthy, tall and straight and serious and intelligent. I still feel inclined to trust her, but I can't. I don't. She has no idea how much she could have hurt me if I had given her just a few more words to use against me. I don't think I'll ever trust her again, and I hate that. She was my best friend, and now she isn't. Wednesday, March 12th, 2025. Garden thieves got in last night. They stripped citrus trees of fruit in the Hisu yard and the Talcott yard. In the process, they trampled what was left of winter gardens and much of the spring planting. Dad says we have to set up, Dad says we have to set up a regular watch. He tried to call a neighborhood association meeting for tonight, but it's a work night for some people, including Gary Hsu, who sleeps over at his job whenever he has to report in person. We're supposed to get together for a meeting on Saturday. Meanwhile, Dad got Jay Garfield, Wyatt, and Kayla Talcott, Alex Montoya, and Edwin Dunn together to patrol the neighborhood in shifts in armed pairs. That meant that except for the Talcotts, who are already a pair, and who are so angry about their garden, that I pity any thief who gets in the way. The others have to find partners among other adults of the neighborhood. Find someone you trust to protect your back, I heard Dad tell the little group. Each pair was to patrol for two hours, just before dark, to just after dawn. The first patrol, walking through or looking into all the backyards, would get people used to the idea of watchers while they were still awake enough to understand. Make sure they see you if you get first watch, Dad said. The sight of you will remind them that there will be watchers all through the night. We don't want any of them mistaking you for thieves. Sensible. People go to bed soon after dark to save electricity, but between dinner and darkness, they spend time on their porches or in their yards where it's not so hot. Some listen to their radio on front or back porches. Now and then, people get together to play music, sing, play board games, talk, or get out on the paved part of the street for volleyball, touch football, basketball, or tennis. 
People used to play baseball, but we just can't afford with that costs and windows. A few people just find a corner and read a book while there's still daylight. It's a good, comfortable, recreational time. What a pity to spoil it with reminders of reality. But it can't be helped. What will you do if you catch a thief? Corey asked my father before he went out. He was on the second shift, and he and Corey were having a rare cup of coffee together in the kitchen while he waited. Coffee was for special occasions. I couldn't miss the good smell of it in my room where I lay awake. I eavesdrop. I don't put drinking glasses to walls or crouch with my ear against doors, but I do often lie awake long after dark when we kids are all supposed to be asleep. The kitchen is across the hall from my room. The dining room is nearby at the end of the hall, and my parents' room is next door. The house is old and well insulated. If there's a shut door between me and the conversation, I can't hear much. But at night, with all or most of the lights out, I can leave my door open a crack, and if other doors are also open, I can hear a lot. I learn a lot. We'll chase him off, I hope, Dad said. We've agreed to that. We'll give him a good scare and let him know that there are easier ways to get a dollar. A dollar? Yes, indeed. Our thieves didn't steal all that food because they were hungry. They stripped those trees. They took everything they could. I know, Corey said. I took some lemons and grapefruits. I took some lemons and grapefruits to both the Jesus and Wyatts today and told them that they could pick from our trees when they needed more. I took them some seed too. They both had a lot of young plants trampled, but this early in the season, they should be able to repair the damage. Yes, my father paused. But you see my point. People steal that way for money. They're not desperate just greedy and dangerous. We might be able to scare them into looking for easier pickings. But what if you can't, Corey asked, almost whispering. Her voice fell so low that I was afraid I would miss something. If you can't, will you shoot them? Yes, he said. Yes, she repeated in the small, in the same small voice. Just yes? She was like Joanne all over again, denial personified. What planet do people like that live on? Yes, my father said. Why? There was a long silence. When my father spoke again, his own voice had gone very soft. Baby, if these people steal enough, they'll force us to spend more than we can afford on food or go hungry. We live on the edge as it is. You know how hard things are. But couldn't we just call the police? For what? We can't afford their fees, and anyway, they're not interested until after a crime has been committed. Even then, if you call them, they won't show up for hours. Maybe not for two or three days. No. What are you saying, then? You want the kids to go hungry? You want thieves coming into the house once they've stripped the gardens? But they haven't done that. Of course they have. Mrs. Sims was only their latest victim. She lived alone. We always said she shouldn't do that. You want to trust them not to hurt you or the kids just because there are seven of us? Baby, we can't live by pretending this is still 20 or 30 years ago. But you could go to jail, she was crying, not sobbing, but speaking with that voice full of tears that she can manage sometimes. No, Dad said. If we have to shoot someone, we're together in it. After we've shot him, we carry him into the nearest house. It's still legal to shoot housebreakers. After that, we do a little damage and get our story straight. Long, long silence. You could still get in trouble. I'll risk it. Another long silence. Thou shalt not kill, Corey whispered. I'm going to butcher this word. Nehemiah 4, Dad said, verse 14. There was nothing more. A few minutes later, I heard Dad leave. I waited until I heard Corey go to her room and shut the door. Then I got up, shut my door, 
moved my lamp so the light wouldn't show under the door, then turned it on and opened my grandmother's Bible. She had had a lot of Bibles, and Dad had let me keep this one. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. Interesting. Interesting that Dad had that verse ready and that Corey recognized it. Maybe they've had this conversation before. Saturday. March 15th, 2025. It's official. Now we have a regular neighborhood watch, a roster of people from every household who are over 18, good with guns, their own and others, and considered responsible by my father and by the people who have already been patrolling the neighborhood. Since none of the, uh, since none of the watchers have ever been cops or security guards, they'll go on working in pairs, watching out for each other as well as for the neighborhood. They'll use whistles to call for help if they need it. Also, they'll meet once a week to read, discuss, and practice martial arts and shootout techniques. The Mon Montoyas will give their martial arts classes, all right, but not at my suggestion. Old Mr. Hisu is having back problems, and he won't be teaching anything for a while, but the Montoyas seem to be enough. I plan to sit on on the classes as often as I can stand to share everyone's practice pains. Dad has collected all his books from me this morning. All I have left are my notes. I don't mind. Thanks to the garden thieves, people are preparing themselves for the worst. I feel almost grateful to the thieves. They haven't come back, by the way, our thieves. When they do, we should be able to give them something they don't expect. Saturday, March 29th, 2025. Our thieves paid us another visit last night. Maybe they weren't the same ones, but their intentions were the same, to take away what someone else has sweated to grow and very much needs. This time, they were after Richard Moss's rabbits. Those rabbits are the neighborhood's only livestock except for some chickens the Cruz and Montoya family try families tried to raise a few years ago. Those were stolen as soon as they were old enough to make noise and let outsiders know that they were there. The Moss rabbits have been our secret until this year when Richard Moss insisted on selling meat and whatever his wives could make from raw or tanned rabbit hides out behind the wall. The Mosses had been selling to us all of, uh, had been selling to us all along. Of course, meat, hides, fertilizer, everything except live rabbits. Those he hoarded as breeding stock, but now, stubborn, arrogant, and greedy, he had decided he could earn more if he peddled his merchandise outside. So now, the word is out on the street about the damned rabbits, and last night, someone came to get them. The Moss Rabbit House is a converted three-car garage added to the property in the 1980s, according to Dad. It's hard to believe any household once had three cars, and gas-fueled cars at that. But I remember the old garage before Richard Moss converted it. It was huge, with three black oil spots on the floor where three cars had once been housed. Richard Moss repaired the walls and roof put in windows for cross ventilation, and in general made the place almost fit for people to live in. In fact, it's much better than what a lot of people live in now on the outside. He built rows and tiers of cages, hutches, and put in more electric lights and ceiling fans. The fans can be made to work on kid power. He's hooked them up to an old bicycle frame and every Moss kid who's old enough to manage the pedal sooner or later gets drafted into powering the fans. The Moss kids hate it, but they know what they'll get if they don't do it. I don't know how many rabbits the Mosses have now, but it seems they're always killing and skinning and doing disgusting things to pelt. Even a little monopoly is worth a lot of trouble. The two thieves had managed to stuff 
13 rabbits into canvas sacks by the time our watchers spotted them. The watchers were Alejandro Montoya and, and uh, Julia Lincoln, one of Shani Yanni's, uh, Yanis's sisters. Mrs. Montoya has two kids sick with the flu, so she's off the watch roster for a while. Mrs. Lincoln and Mr. Montoya followed the plan that the group of watchers had put together at their meetings. Without a word of command or warning, they fired their guns into the air two or three times each at the same time, blowing their whistles full blast. They kept to cover, but inside the moss house, someone woke up and turned on the rabbit house lights. That could have been a lethal mistake for the watchers, but they were hidden behind pomegranate bushes. The two thieves ran like rabbits, abandoning sacks, rabbits, pry bars, a long coil of rope, wire cutters, and even an excellent long aluminum ladder. They scrambled up that ladder and over the walls in seconds. Our wall is three meters high and topped off with pieces of broken glass as well as the usual barbed wire and the all but invisible Lazor wire. All the wire had been cut in spite of our efforts. What a pity we couldn't afford to electrify it or set other traps. But at least the glass, the oldest, simplest of our tricks, had gotten one of them. We found a broad stream of dried blood down the inside of the wall this morning. We also found a Glock 19 pistol where one of the thieves had dropped it. Mrs. Lincoln and Mr. Montoya could have been shot. If the thieves hadn't been scared out of their minds, there could have been a gun battle. Someone in the moss house or a neighboring house could have been hurt or killed. Corey went after Dad about that once they were alone in the kitchen. I know, Dad said. He sounded tired and miserable. Don't think we haven't thought about those things. That's why we want to scare the thieves away. Even shooting into the air isn't safe. Nothing is safe. They ran away this time, but they won't always run. I know. So what then? You protect rabbits or oranges and maybe get a child killed? Silence. We can't live this way, Corey shouted. I jumped. I've never heard her sound like that before. We do live this way, Dad said. There was no anger in his voice, no emotional response at all to her shouting. There was nothing. Weariness. Sadness. I've never heard him sound so tired, so almost beaten. And yet he had won. His idea had beaten off a pair of armed thieves without our having to hurt anyone. If the thieves had hurt themselves, that was their problem. Of course they would come back or others would come. That would happen no matter what, and Corey was right. The next thieves might not lose their guns and run away. So what? Should we lie in our beds and let them take all we had and hope that they were content with stripping our gardens? How long does a thief stay content? And what's it like to starve? We couldn't make it without you, Corey was saying. She wasn't shouting. That could have been you out there facing criminals. Next time it might be you. You could be shot protecting the neighbor's rabbits. Did you notice Dad said that every off-duty watcher answered the whistles last night? They came out to defend their community. I don't care about them. It's you I'm worried about. No, he said. We can't think that way anymore. Corey, there's nobody to help us but God and ourselves. I protect Moss's place in spite of what I think of him, and he protects mine, no matter what he thinks of me. We all look out for one another. He paused. I got plenty of insurance. You and the kids should be able to make it all right if... No, Corey said. Do you think that's all it is? Money? Do you think... No, babe, no. Pause. I know what it is to be left alone. This is no world to be alone in. There was a long silence, and I didn't think they would say any more. I lay on my bed wondering if I should get up and shut my door so I can turn on my lamp and write. But there was a little more. What are we supposed to do if you die, she demanded. And I think she was crying. What do we do if they shoot you over some damn rabbits? Live, Dad said. That's all anybody can do right now. Live. Hold out. Survive. I don't know whether good times are coming back. 
again. But I know that that won't matter if we don't survive these times. That was the end of their talk. I lay in the dark for a long time thinking about what they had said. Corey was right again. Dad might get hurt. He might get killed. I don't know how to think about that. I can write about it, but I don't feel it. On some deep level, I don't believe it. I guess I'm as good at denial as anyone. So Corey is right, but it doesn't matter. And Dad is right, but he doesn't go far enough. God is change, and in the end, God prevails. But God exists to be shaped. It isn't enough for us to just survive, limping along, playing business as usual while things get worse and worse. If that's the shape we give to God, then someday we must become too weak, too poor, too hungry, too sick to defend ourselves. Then we'll be wiped out. There has to be more that we can do, a better destiny that we can shape, another place, another way, something. All right, it is 10 o'clock, so we will stop there. And I am going to stop the recording as well. <laughs>